According to Galatians chapter 5, verse 23, let's read this passage together. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Let's read together. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Against such there is no law. And so for the, for the past two weeks, we've been talking about joy. We've been talking about what joy means. And so before you understand what something is, sometimes you have to understand what it's not. And so we looked at where you can't find joy. And we studied the life of Solomon, this king in the Bible, this great king, very powerful, lots of money. And we saw that you can't find joy in pleasure. You can't find joy in money. You can't find joy in fame. You can't find joy in youth. And you can't find joy in knowledge. You can't find joy in any of these things, according to Ecclesiastes. He wrote a whole book about the same thing, and he experienced, he, he had pleasure. He had, the Bible says Solomon had 700 wives. Now, maybe this is why he asked for so much wisdom, because, you know, it's, 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 it's enough to have one. Trust me, I know. It's enough to manage one relationship. This man is trying to manage 700 relationships, plus he had 300 side chicks, 300 side pieces. And so I see why, why he asked the Lord for so much wisdom, because you need a lot of wisdom if you're, trying to, if you're trying to handle that. And so Solomon, he experienced all of these things, and at the end of it, he said, you can't find joy in pleasure, or money, or fame, or youth, or knowledge. You can't find joy in all of, none of those things. And then after that, we saw that joy is not laughter. It's possible for someone to be smiling and laughing, and they put a, a good front in front of you. But back home, in the privacy of their room, they're crying 24-7. So joy is not laughter. It's not a smile. It's much more deeper than that. And we saw that joy is not pleasure. Pleasure is temporary. When you go out to the club and you drink and you turn up all night long, you enjoy it for that period of time. But when you get back home, you're right back to where you started. That emptiness is still there. It's the same thing when you're having, um, it's the same thing when you're enjoying the flesh, when you're having sex out of wedlock. It's the same thing when you're doing drugs. It's the same thing. All of it, none of it brings pleasure. None of it brings pleasure. And so we saw that joy is not laughter, it's not pleasure. Joy is knowing Jesus, is knowing Jesus Christ. The believer's true source of joy is having a relationship with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And walking with him from day to day. And being in communion with him day to day because he's satisfied. He satisfies and Jesus satisfies fully. He satisfies and he satisfies fully. Is that all right, church? Is that all right, church? All right, good. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are giving us the opportunity to be a vessel, to be an instrument. Who am I, Lord? Who am I? This morning, Lord, we humbly come before you, and we ask that your people, that you would prepare the seed, you would prepare the heart of your people to receive your word. We come against all forms of distractions, Lord, both in here and online. And we declare, Lord, that your presence will dwell in this place. And chains will be broken in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So today we will continue with the same thing of joy. We'll continue to talk about joy. The question we want to answer today is, why be joyful? Why is it important for a believer to have joy? Why is it important for a believer to carry joy? joy with him 
or her. So this morning, I would like to make the case as to why the believer should be joyful. This morning, there are at least four reasons why the believer should have joy. At least four reasons. And by the way, everything that I'm talking about this morning can be found in our devotional book, The Fruit of the Spirit. The devotional book is more of an in-depth look of what we talk about on Sunday. So if you have not gotten your copy of the book, we encourage you to do so as you're walking out or you can get it on Amazon. It's everything that I will talk about today comes straight from the book. So four reasons why the believer should be joyful. Number one, the first reason why the believer should be joyful is we serve a joyful God. We serve a joyful God. When it comes to God, we have this perception about God that God is this mean, depressed God that's up in heaven just punishing folks for their sin. This mean God, this depressed God, this God who's always saying, no, don't do that. Don't steal that. You know better than that. No, don't go there. You know better than that. No, I'm going to send you to hell. I'm going to send you to hell. This is the perception that sometimes we have of God. But that's not at all who the Bible presents God as. That's not who God, that's not who God is. When you look at Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17, let's read together. It said, the Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Rejoice, gladness, singing. Does that sound like a depressed God? Does that sound like a God who's just in heaven just feeling sorry for himself? No, when the Bible talks about God, according to this verse, God is a God that's rejoicing. He's a God that has gladness and is a God that's, that's singing. Not only is God presented that way, but Jesus also is presented the same way. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 9, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 9 says, You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of the oil of gladness is talking about Jesus. It says that God has anointed Jesus with the oil of gladness, which means that joy and gladness radiates from Jesus. So God is a joyful God. Jesus is joyful. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit is presented as a joyful spirit. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse 17. It says, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in, in, oh, I didn't hear you, in, in the Holy Spirit. And so what do you have? You have God who is singing and rejoicing. You have Jesus who is covered with the oil of gladness. And then you have the Holy Spirit who is peace, love, and joy. And so when I look at heaven, when I look at the fellowship that exists between God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I don't see something gloomy. I don't see like a a black and white picture of someone who's depressed. I don't see rain in heaven. On the contrary, I see color. I see a spectrum of colors. I see rejoicing. I see gladness. I see joy. And this is why when Jesus thought about the kingdom, He would often compare the kingdom to a banquet. Is that all right, church? He would often compare the kingdom to a banquet or to a party or to a wedding. As a matter of fact, in Revelation, it says that when God is going to come back, it's going to be like a bride that's coming to meet. It's it's like a groom that's coming to meet the bride. Now, let me ask you a question. Is Is there sorrow at a wedding? Is there sorrow at a a banquet? Is there sorrow in a party? No. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that when a believer comes to Christ, there is rejoicing in heaven. They're partying. They're turning up. They're lit. 
in heaven. So when I look at heaven, I don't see a depressed God, but I see a joyful God. I see God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're together in fellowship. There's no depression. There's no sadness. There's no sorrow. But I see a perfect joy between the two or between the three. Perfect joy. They're enjoying themselves. They're not worried. They're, you know, it's possible now. Let me, let me say this. It's possible to grieve God. Right? Because the Bible says when we sin, we grieve him, but God doesn't dwell in grief. Do you understand the difference? So it's possible that someone can grieve God, but he doesn't dwell in it. He dwells in joy. Is that all right, church? So the first reason why we should be joyful is because we serve a joyful God. We serve a joyful God. Number two, the second reason to be joyful is that Jesus wants you to be joyful. He wants you to be joyful. The same joy that Jesus shares with the Holy Spirit and God in perfect communion, perfect fellowship, he wants you to have the same joy. Look at John chapter 15, verse 11. John 15, verse 11 says, Jesus is talking here. He says, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. So as Jesus is on his way to the cross, I imagine he's thinking, he's saying, I'm going to go, but I have to leave something for them. And that thing that he's going to leave, which is the Holy Spirit, that thing has to have the ability to give them joy so the joy that's in me can be in them. It was never his intention to just leave us all depressed, and sorrow. He wanted to leave us with joy. So this is why he prayed to the Father that we may have joy. Is that all right, church? Look at what it says again in John chapter 17, verse 13. Jesus is talking again. He says, but now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my, that they may have my, my joy fulfilled in themselves. So he wants that whatever joy that he had for us to have the same level of the fullness of that joy. Is that all right, church? And so when you understand that, you understand that the believer doesn't ask for joy because he already has it. You don't ask for something you already have. Right? It's like the story I took my daughter to Disney World a few months ago uh, in November. And then we took her to Disney World. And then she wanted to go to Disney World, and then we took her. While we're in Disney World, because you know in Disney World, when you go there, the first thing is the lines. You have, there's a line for parking. After you go through that line, there's a bus. After the bus, there's a train. After the train, you go to ticketing. After ticketing, there's so many things to do before you actually go inside of Disney World. So I'm there with my wife and my daughter, and then... You know, we're in Disney World, and then, you know, I'm having a good time. Uh, I, I don't know about my wife. I think my wife was having a good time, too. But it seems as if my daughter was not having the time that we thought she was going to have. And it's only because she didn't see the rides yet. And then in, in the middle of Disney World, she looks at me, and she says, Daddy, I want to go to Disney World. <laughs> in the middle of Disney World. She tells me I want to go to Disney. So I'm like, wait, wait a minute. Am I, am I at the wrong place here? Baby, you are in Disney World. But isn't that what happens, though, in the Christian life? We ask God to take us somewhere we're already at. We ask God for joy without realizing if you're a believer, you are saved by grace, you have the Holy Spirit in you, you already have joy. It's not something that you seek. It's something that you ask for God to activate into your life. Because you already have it. You want, is, is that all right, church? You already have it. And so the second reason why you have to be joyful is because Jesus wants you to be joyful. Touch your neighbor and say, cheer up, neighbor. Cheer up, cheer up. Touch the other person. Say, cheer up. You're a little... You're a little too, uh, you know, uptight and upset. Just cheer up a little bit. Because in heaven, that's the atmosphere of the heaven. The people of the kingdom of God are people that are happy. There are people that are joyful. There are people that are 
uh, there are people that have, that, that have joy. They're merry people. That's the second reason why the believer should be joyful. The third reason, joy keeps you healthy. Joy keeps you healthy. Did you know that people who are happy are healthier? Did you know that? Numerous st studies have been done to prove that people who are joyful, those people, they are healthier. They have less chance of having cancer, less chance of having heart disease, less chance of having accidents, and less chance of dying prematurely. That's some good news. You see, science has a way of confirming what the Bible told us in the first place. I didn't need a whole bunch of studies to realize that joy brings health. The more joyful you are, the healthier you are. Look at what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22. Proverbs 17, verse 22. Let's read together. It says, if you are cheerful, you feel... If you are sad, you hurt all over. Ain't that the truth? If you are cheerful, you ever seen someone who has a terminal disease? And even though they have the terminal disease, the fact that they are cheerful, it keeps them alive. It keeps them strong. You don't even know that this person has a terminal disease because they have joy. And the opposite is true. Someone can have a little cold, a little flu, and the person is all sad and all depressed. My God, it's like this person is about to die. The difference is how joyful are you in the situation? The more joyful you are, even in the sickness, the more chances of you getting healed. The more choice chances of you getting healed. Beloved, this is important. Why is this important? Because God has created all of us for a purpose. Ain't nobody got time to die early. Do you understand what I'm saying? Think about it. God has called everybody for a purpose. He has called different, some of us to impact in different areas of the world. He has called some of us to impact in the business world, in the politics, in healthcare, in all types of different areas. But if I'm always sad and sickness take over, how am I supposed to make the impact that God wants me to make if I'm always sad and I'm always sick? And so you understand now that one of the things that you can do to maintain your health, to remain healthy, it's just to be joyful. Don't sweat the small stuff. The studies say that 90, uh, about 90% of the things that we worry about, they never happen in the first place. They never happen. So you sitting here worried about the job, you're never going to lose the job in the first place. You worried about the sickness, you're not going to die from that sickness in the first place. You're going to die the day that God wants you to die. Don't get me wrong. But you're not going to die from that sickness. You're worried about that marriage, but you don't know that God is building you up and taking care of you, even in the midst of the marital problems. And so the reason, the third reason why the believer should remain healthy, should have joy, is because joy keeps you healthy. I don't got time to die early. I don't. I have too many things to do for God. I have a purpose to walk into. I have a destiny to walk into. I have a calling to fulfill. I can't die early. I don't got time for touching the base. Nobody got time for that. Nobody got time for that. I don't got time to die early. I'm going to die the day that he wanted me to die, and I'm not going to let sickness or sorrow or sadness kill me. I'm going to die the day that God wanted me to die. So when you have joy, 
Joy keeps you healthy. Joy will keep you healthy. Now, number four. So we said so far, number one, why should you be healthy? Number one is what? We serve a joyful God. Number two, Jesus wants you to be. Number three, joy keeps you healthy. Number four, joy gives you strength. Joy gives you strength. In Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10, I'll give you a quick background or context of what we're about to read. Nehemiah, the people of God are displaced somewhere. They're in captivity. God finally allows for them to come back home and to their homeland. But as they're back home into their homeland, they run into opposition. They run into trouble. They run into issues. And God calls one out of the generation. Let me tell you, God always calls somebody out of a generation. Is that all right, guys? God always calls somebody out of that generation. And thank God in this generation, God has called our spiritual father, Pastor Greg, to be the Nehemiah of this generation and to rebuild the temple of God. And so God calls Nehemiah to come back to the land and to rebuild the walls of the land. And so with everything, there's opposition. And so there's people that are starting to talk. There's uh, this guy named Sambala. Whose name is Sambala anyways? I mean, what a name is that? Anyway, so he's talking bad about Nehemiah. He'll, he's saying, Nehemiah, you will never accomplish this. This will never happen. And in the middle of the trouble of the issues, the people of God became sorrowful. And then one day, they were reading the word of God. They were reading the word of God. I don't know maybe if it was the word that hit them so hard. I don't know if they were convicted by the word. I don't know what was happening. But they were all reading the word of God. And the Bible says that everyone started crying. Everyone was sorrowful. Nehemiah chapter 8. Everyone was upset. Everyone was sad. And then here's what Nehemiah stood up as the fierce leader that he was. Then he said to them, Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10. He says, go your way. Eat the fat. Drink the sweet. Send the portions to those whom nothing is prepared. In other words, he's saying, guys, stop crying. If you have to eat, go eat something good. If you got to eat, go eat some filet mignon, some, you know, I don't know. What's, what's good food nowadays? What's good food? Go eat some grillo. He says, drink the sweet. Go, go have yourself a little bit of ice cream. Go rejoice yourself and send some of that to the, to the people that you love. Look at what it says, the, the last part of the verse, Nehemiah chapter 10, uh, 8, verse 10, the last part. If you would project the last part of the verse. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. And so Nehemiah says, listen, go eat your sweet, go eat the fat, go and send a portion of it to, to the rest of the people who have nothing. It says, for this day, the holy, for this day is holy to you, to our Lord, do not sorrow. Next verse. For the joy of the Lord is your, the joy of the Lord is your, the joy of the Lord is is your strength. Brother Melky, what does that mean? The joy of the Lord is your strength. What does that mean? I know it sounds very spiritual, don't it? It's, it sounds like spiritual. Girl, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Bro, bro, the joy of the Lord is my strength. You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about? The joy of the Lord is my strength. It sounds very spiritual, but what does it really mean? The joy of the Lord is my strength. It means that joy equals strength. I'll say it again. Joy equals strength. I'll say it again. Joy equals strength. Now say it with me. Joy equals strength. Say it again. 
Joy equals strength. An example of this is Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Paul said to the Christians, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. When you really study this passage, you will realize this man who's talking, who's telling everybody to rejoice, he's actually in jail. This man is locked up in chains. His feet are locked up. His hands are locked up. He's in prison. He probably has little food. He probably is in isolation. He's probably in a dark room by himself. Now, why is it that this man is saying, rejoice in the Lord always? I repeat, rejoice. He's not supposed to be saying that. He's in prison. Is that all right, church? This verse is almost contradictory. How are you in prison? You're in a dark and solitude by yourself, yet you're encouraging other people to rejoice in the Lord. Beloved, listen to this. Every time you're in a bad situation, every time you're in a situation that merits for you to be sad or sorrowful or heartbroken or somber or defeated or unhappy or dejected, Every time you're in one of those situations, and then yet you, still have, yet you still have joy, that means the joy of the Lord is your strength for that situation. Every time you are in a situation that allows for you to be, man, I'm, I can't understand this situation, and you're sad and you're upset, but even in the in the middle of the situation, you find joy. That means the strength, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says that Jesus, for the joy of the cross that was before him, he endured the cross. Now, wait a minute. This man is walking. He's on death row. He's about to be crucified. But the Bible says that for the joy of the cross. So that means every time he took a step, even though the situation around him was not the perfect situation, but he still had the joy to go through the situation. Even though they put um, they put thorns, of the, a crown of thorns on his head. They slapped him. They beat him. They put nails on his hands. But for the joy of the cross, he endured. At that point, the joy of God was the strength of Jesus. Is that all right, church? The joy of God was the strength of Jesus. I asked the Holy Spirit, how do I make this clearer for his people? And this week, the Lord said to me that life is like a yo-yo. Anybody remember the yo-yos? Oh, yeah, no, yeah, come on, yeah. The 80s and the 90s babies in here, anybody remember the yo-yos? All right. Now, if you were born in the 2000s and beyond, you probably a little bit too young. Anybody, uh, the young people, you guys know what a yo-yo is? Really? So they do know. The back, do you guys know what a yo-yo is? The people in the back, y'all know what a yo-yo is? All right. So a yo-yo is a toy that I always ask my parents for, but they never got to me. All right? Because I had Haitian parents. And so every time I would ask a mom, can I get a yo-yo? No, no, no. Say bye, bye, capo. <laughs> but I did what most of y'all did. We bought it anyways. And we put it in our backpack and we go to school with it, hoping that my mom will never catch me playing with the vacabo toy. <laughs> Am I the only one? <laughs> I know I'm not the only one. And so a yo-yo, I brought a yo-yo, by the way. So here's, here's what a yo-yo does. So, if you know anything about playing with a yo-yo, you will realize that a yo-yo works a certain way. Right? So, let me put my yo-yo on right quick. (laughs) All right, I got my yo-yo. I got my yo-yo. By the way, I spent the whole day yesterday playing with this thing. (laughs) All right. So, if you know anything about a yo-yo, you will know that a yo-yo goes down and it comes back up. 
and it goes down, and it comes back up. And it goes down, and it comes back up. And there are people who are able to make tricks and make it go down for longer periods of time, but I don't got time for that. I don't know how to do that. But all you need to know is that a yo-yo goes down, and it comes back up. The Holy Spirit revealed to me that life is like a yo-yo. It has ups and downs. So whenever you find the news that you're sick and they tell you that you have terminal cancer, it's just like the yo-yo that goes down. Whenever you have problems in your marriage, it's like, it's like life trying to bring you down just like this yo-yo is going down. Whenever the best friend that you had, the person that you trusted, the same person betray you and stabbed you in the back, that's life trying to bring you down just like a yo-yo. But notice one thing about the yo-yo. The yo-yo comes down, but it does not stay down. Hey! The yo-yo will come down, but it won't stay down. And the Lord revealed to me that life is just like a yo-yo. He is just like a yo-yo also. Whenever you find yourself being thrown down in life just like this, just remember that the same way you go down, even though it looks like you're about to hit the floor, you can't hit the floor. You will always come back up because you are a yo-yo. That means my life can't hit the floor because I'm a yo-yo. My life cannot hit the floor because I am a yo-yo. The life of the believer is that such as a yo-yo, you will be thrown down. You will have difficult situations. You will lose your job. You will have sickness. You will have people betray and backstab you. But when you have the joy of the Lord, ah, when you have the joy of the Lord, some way, somehow, you can't stay on the floor, but you have to come back up. You have to come back up. You have to come back up. Because the yo-yo has something that's built inside of it. When you study the physics of a yo-yo, it has something that's built inside of it that gives it strength not only to go down, but also to come back up. And so the same strength that the yo-yo has, you also have in, in you. That strength is called joy. That means whatever situation in life, you will go down. But you can't hit the floor if you're in Christ. My yo-yo will go down. But just when it's about to hit the floor, something stops it. Not only does it stop it, but it recoils right back up. So in the middle of the situation, in the middle of the marriage, if you see I'm in the marital problems, if you see I'm smiling, don't think that I'm weird or bizarre, I'm careless. It's because I have the joy of the Lord. If you see that I'm sick, in the middle of my sickness, the doctor said you will never be healed. They're giving me six months to live. It's not that I'm careless. I'm smiling because I have the joy of the Lord. And whenever there's joy, there's strength. If there's joy, there's strength. If there's joy, there's strength. If you're in that situation and you, you don't know how to make it through, just count on the joy of the Lord. Just seek the joy of the Lord or allow the joy of the Lord to manifest in your life. You see, Christ didn't promise that it would be easy. He didn't promise that there wouldn't be no sicknesses. He didn't promise that people wouldn't backstab you. He didn't promise that you wouldn't have financial problems. He didn't promise that you wouldn't have issues in your marriage. He didn't promise that you would pass the exam every time on the first time that you took it. But he promised that every time you go down, he's there with you and he will bring you right back up. And I'm here to tell you this morning, just like the yo-yo goes down and comes back into the hands of the owner, you will go down 
and you come right back into the hands of your owner. Beloved, I'm here to encourage somebody this morning. If you have joy in the midst of the situation, you have everything. The difference between happiness and joy, happiness is temporary. Joy is eternal. This is why I encourage somebody today, don't rely on a man to bring you happiness. Don't do it. Don't think that a boyfriend is going to make you happy. Don't think that that new house is going to make you happy. You see, happiness is when it's there, everything is okay. But what happens when it's taken away from you? What happens when you don't have it anymore? What happens when that boyfriend isn't faithful and he cheats on you and he puts your business out there? What happens when the house is, the hurricane comes and you forgot to put insurance in the house and you're, you're there with a house that's broken and you can't fix it? What happens when you lose the dream job? You see, joy is different. Joy is the ability to remain strong despite the hardship, despite the trouble. Despite everything that life brings at you, if you are able to remain joyful, then you have the strength of the Lord. Come on, give it to the Lord in this place. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet. This morning, there are two types of people in this place. There are those who came with no problems at all. You came in this place and life is just peachy. Life is perfect. Life is just going the way that you've always expected life to go. That's the first category. The second category are the people who came broken. Are the people who came with something that they're dealing with. The people who came with some type of marital problem. The people who came with some type of addiction that they're dealing with. The people who came with some type of struggle. If you're part of the second category of people, this morning, what we will do in this place, we will release a shout of joy. And with this shout of joy, I declare that every sadness and sorrowness, everything that's not of God, as you're releasing the shout of joy, I declare that your peace also will be released. That your joy also will be released in Jesus Christ's name. I'll give you a few seconds. I want you to think right now of everything that's been stealing your joy. Everything that's been stealing your joy. Your happiness. Your merriness. Everything that stole. Everything that you've had. Think of those things right now. I don't know. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's a girlfriend. Maybe it's your financial problem. Maybe it's your marital problems. At the count of five, you will release these things into the atmosphere. And as you're releasing them, we declare that the joy of God we declare that your joy, God, will be released in this place. In Jesus Christ's name. Come on. One, two, three, four, five. Come on and shout. Come on and shout. Shout in this place. Shout in this place. Freedom in this place. Joy in this place. Joy in this place. Joy in this place. In this place. The joy of God in this place. Shekinah App Téléchargez-le